So good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for the Cambridge Festival. Uh, you may have been here before. If you haven't, this is the Isaac Newton Institute. We're an international research centre. If you want to learn more, just come and find me afterwards or check out our website. Um, so I'm going to give a very brief introduction. Many of you may already be familiar with Ben Alanak. Um, I've written down some notes so I get all the words correct. Uh, ben is a professor of theoretical physics in the theoretical high energy particle physics group here in Cambridge. Um, in the 2000s, he worked at CERN on the outskirts of Geneva, and he still returns there as a visiting scientist. And in terms of outreach, such as events like this, uh, you may have read comments from Ben in New Scientist, The Economist, BBC News, and uh, very recently, I think, as a panellist on the Infinite Monkey Cage. So uh, without further ado, Professor Ben Alamak. Thank you. Thanks for that warm welcome. Um, the most important thing I've got to tell you right now is if you think of any question, anything you're curious about, just uh, remember it because I'm going to stop at various points in the talk and uh, I'll take questions from the audience. And I find that the Q&A is the, is the best bit of the talk. It's much more interesting than hearing me drone on. Okay. So uh, as Dan said, I'm a particle physicist. I used to work at CERN. We deal with uh, the tiny things, right? They're a, they're a thousandth of a billionth of a meter across. That's where all the interesting action that we're interested in is happening. Um, so that's quite strange. And, uh, you know, every day I have to shrink my mind uh, to those distance scales. And so I feel a bit like uh, Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> so what I'm going to try and do is um, bring you on a journey with me. And uh, we're going to go uh, down the rabbit hole and try and shrink our, uh, our minds um, just to get used to the distance scales. So if we, shrink, if we take the mushroom and we shrink ourselves down to one centimetre, that's roughly the kind of size of a, a fly. And if we shrink ourselves further down to a millimetre, we'd be able to see the fly's eye. Um, and then further a hundredth of a millimetre, you can see these bristles in between the compound segments of the fly's eye. And at a millionth of a millimetre, we'd be able to see strands of DNA if we were really that small. And you can see these, um, these kind of spheres, white, uh, a white sphere, for example. Um, those are atoms. And here is a depiction uh, of an atom at a ten millionth uh, of a millimetre. Now, uh, this isn't exactly realistic. <laughs> First of all, there's no face on the, on the atoms. But secondly, um, the middle bit should be tiny. You, you wouldn't be able to see it. So that's the nucleus. We have the electrons going around the outside. Um, and in the middle, we have these uh, particles, one of which I've drawn a face on because uh, that particle, the proton, is going to help me tell my story today. OK, so this proton uh, is a cosmic survivor. It was created in the early universe in the primordial soup uh, about 13.4 billion years ago or so. And, um, you know, it's seen everything. It's seen the formation of stars, of uh, planets, of our Milky Way, which you just saw. Um, and uh, here's our planet, Earth. Um, and somewhere in the middle of uh, Europe, is uh, Geneva, that's uh, the Lake Geneva there coming in, looks like a moustache. Um, and on the edge of Geneva, on the Franco-Swiss border, lies the Large Hadron Collider and the CERN Laboratory, the European Centre for Particle Physics. So um, when you fly in, you'll see in a minute, you can't actually see this circle, it's underneath the ground. But that's where the uh, accelerator um, lies, it, uh, it's a map of the accelerator. So um, actually, when you, apart from the map of uh, the underground that I've superposed, when you fly into Geneva, you can, depending on which way you fly in, you can see a view like this. So um, you can see the lake uh, to the left-hand side. In the background, there are the Alps. And the plain, roughly speaking, is over the Jura uh, Mountains. So you either come in um, this way or the other way, but um, it, it sort of depends a bit on the weather and so on. Um, but the reason I put the London Underground over the top is because if you can see this red circle underneath, that's the trajectory of the accelerator. And you can see it's about the same size as the circle line in uh, the London Underground. It's about 18 miles around. Okay, so that's why I've superposed that. 
So if you go uh, down 100 meters underneath the Earth, what you'll find um, underneath this circle is a tunnel, a curved tunnel that goes around in a circle uh, with these um, structures in it. These are superconducting magnets, um, and they contain the beams that are collided together. So there's two counter-rotating beams with protons, and we'll see um, at various points there, uh, they cross the streams, and as a particle physicists, we're interested in what happens then, at that moment when the proton protons collide, you get collisions, and we want to see what comes out. Okay, this is, um, that's a maintenance guy going around on his, uh, on his trolley. Um, you know, if it's 18 miles, <laughs> they, they need to be able to get around with vehicles. You're not allowed uh, down there while the accelerator is on, um, but a good four months of the year, it's off for maintenance. And they pick the winter months because um, the electricity is expensive then to run it. Um, and so for, it's just starting up now, for example. But if you're ever in Geneva and you want to have a look, go to CERN. It's a, it's, um, a tram ride away from the airport. Uh, and there are like 20 free tours off offered every day for, for members of the public. And you know, if you go at the right time of year, you'll be able to go down. If you're there at the wrong time of year, there's still lots of interesting things uh, to show you in the visitor center and so on. So I really recommend it, it's free. Uh, and you'll get professional physicists who work at CERN who volunteered to take you around to uh, give you, take you on a visit. So you can see um, <laughs> the curvature of the tunnel is more or less the same as the circle line. This is at Bank Station. So. All right, um, so we're gonna see now a, a sort of picture of the accelerator underneath the ground spinning around. If I can get this video to work. Yeah, so here, the, the white line here is the tunnel. And what you can see is that at various points, there are access shafts, shafts up to the um, surface where people get down on, and there are bigger caverns here, for example, on the left. That's where the experiments uh, are held and where the uh, beams are crossed. So the 100 meters of Earth is used to filter out cosmic radiation because that would confuse um, the, uh, the detectors, the experiments, and we wouldn't be able to see uh, what we need to see with them, basically. So our friend, the proton, um, somehow, you know, <laughs> seen the invention of uh, Belgium and Jam and, uh, you know, uh, galaxies, uh, but the one that we're following ends up in this bottle. This is underneath the CERN laboratory, and it's a bottle of hydrogen. So uh, molecular hydrogen are, uh, is two protons, and we've got electrons uh, bound uh, around them, uh, around it. Uh, sorry, proton and neutron. And um, every now, so this hydrogen is heated up. The electrons are stripped off. We get left with a, a proton. It's, and then every now and again, it's, uh, the bottle's opened, and this, gets, this proton gets accelerated off by electric and magnetic fields. So that's how we start the beams in the uh, Large Hadron Collider. This is a map of the accelerator complex looking from above. So you can see here, um, this ring here, the big ring, that's the one that I showed you on the pictures before, that's the Large Hadron Collider. The proton bottle is here at this black square. So to start off with, there's a, a linear accelerator that gets it up to a third of the speed of light. So the protons are, are skimmed off with electric fields and then electric fields give them a push along this linear accelerator. They're fed into this little ring uh, where they're sped up to about 87% of the speed of light. And then some of them are skimmed off, fed into this big ring where they're um, sped up further and then um, they're um, put into the Large Hadron Collider. So remember, you've got two beams actually going in opposite directions. And by, their, by then, they're going at 99.9999% of the speed of light. The speed of light's the fastest speed that one can re reach. Doesn't matter how much energy you put in, you just get slightly closer towards the speed of light. But the speed isn't the important thing. Um, it's really the energy. That's what we're interested in with these collisions. Um, because what we want to do is turn the energy of the beams into mass. We're using Einstein's equation. Oh, let me write, uh, this is a proper lecture now. <laughs> e is mc squared, okay? E is energy, 
m is mass of particle, and c is uh, speed of light. All right. Now, what we're trying to do is produce heavier particles that haven't been produced before because we've got a lot of energy. So we're turning the energy into mass in the collisions. Um, and one of the big things to do is to try and find the Higgs boson. But um, you can see where the, where the beams are crossed at these uh, yellow stars here. And at each one of those, um, there's an experiment, a detector. Um, and, okay, so this is the e equals mc squared. Um, let me skip that, actually. Uh, okay. And I was just going to show you... <coughs> okay, so the, the um, CERN started up in 2009. And you might remember there was a lot of hullabaloo because two uh, Americans were suing the US government um, because they said, well, CERN might produce black holes which could devour the Earth. Uh, and, you know, the American government was helping to fund it. And so they were suing the American government. And, uh, you know, CERN uh, ended up uh, having a task force to prove that uh, this couldn't be uh, an issue. There are various ways of telling that that, that was the case. Um, but some wag uh, put this on the internet at the time that the Large Hadron Collider was starting up in 2009. So what you see here is, uh, that's a picture of the experimental cavern. That's the car park above it. Beams are starting. And we see the black holes sucking all the cars. <laughs> so I don't know who did that. It was very naughty of them. Of course, that wasn't, it was just a joke. All right, um, let me take questions at this point, if there are any. Yes? Can you watch that video again? Yeah, you can watch it. <laughs> <laughs> this, actually, this talk will be. Um, uh, will be recorded and put online, so you'll be able to watch it as many times as you want after, but uh, we'll watch it again. <laughs> it's a great, it is fun. Much quicker. If a black hole were really to form, it'd be much faster than that. We wouldn't know anything about it. Was it the Princess of Wales who put that up? <laughs> That's right. I think there was another question. Yeah. How does the proton cylinder, which you described, it's just like, it looks like a conventional gas cylinder, is that hydrogen in there, or what is in there to get the protons out? Most of, most of the kit in those um, blue cylinders is actually super, is, um, cryogenics for the liquid helium system. Okay. The whole thing, it, using superconducting magnets, because um, they're like the strongest magnets ever developed at the time, 14 Tesla magnets. And so they've got to be uh, special and superconducting. So they're cooled down to four degrees above absolute zero. So it's, it's actually colder than deep space. Um, and it's a big deal. You, you start off. Sorry, I'll ask you, you described it as the proton cylinder. Oh, oh, OK. That was a mistake. Thank you. Yeah, there are two beams in there actually. They're, they're about golf ball. So is the cylinder helium in the cylinder that you showed? Uh, there are systems in there with pipes that have helium in them. And, th and then there are two more pipes where the proton beams go, go in. And then there's magne magnets and focusing systems. So th there's quite a lot of complicated stuff in each, in each module, yeah. There's one more question at the back, I'll take. Yeah, just wondering how you get the protons to go in opposite directions. Um, oh, there's a returning... Uh, Magnetic field, and you know, so it's going up in, in one, one side and, and down on the other. Yes, yeah, good question. Yeah. How is it that those magnetic fields, which are presumably very strong, don't interfere with each other? Well, they do somewhat, but they're very localized. So you, you, you organize it so they're going like this on one side and going the opposite way on the other. But I mean, in the middle, they do. They do there must you know. be some. Yeah, that's right. So there's when you switch uh, the magnets on. The, these these uh, blue cylinders are held together with these metal structures called fingers. And at uh, one time, they were doing maintenance on it, actually, after the uh, 
uh, accident in 2009 when there was an explosion. And um, they had to be warmed up to normal temperature and then cooled back down. And in that process, um, when they switched the magnets back on, the, the, the fingers buckled. And so the, they were out of alignment and, the, and it wouldn't work properly. And they, couldn't, they had to work out where along the ring um, there was a problem. And some very clever engineer um, realized that you could put a ping pong ball down the beam pipe and they blew these ping pong balls around the beam pipe and listened to see where it rattles. And that's when they found it. And it was it only took like two days. It was going to take them months and millions of dollars to, uh, to fix. Yeah. Did the electricity bill any idea? Um, I don't know what the bill is. Uh, it'd be a lot. But what I can tell you is it's the, the power consumption of the Large Hadron Collider is about the same as a medium town. So it's about 100 megawatts. Do you have your own power station? They, um, they, no, they, they don't have, they have small uh, generators and things, but they buy power from the French grid from EDF, actually. And that's why, you know, it's cheaper in, uh, in you know, in, in the rest of the year, but not in winter. So they switch off at winter. Yeah. Yep. How are they able to apply the pearls with enough precision to sift the drift off with the collision to work towards That's a very good question. Um, they're focused, the beams are focused to be very intense and, and uh, very small with, with actually magnetic uh, fields in the horizontal direction. So they're squeezed, the beams are squeezed. But still, we'll see in a minute, um, most of the protons just miss each other. But you only need, you know, every time you, you cross them, you just need the odd collision because they're going round and round and round this ring. So, um, yeah, I'll show, I'll show you that in a second. In fact, let, let's get on. If you've got more questions, still remember them because we'll be having more Q&A uh, in, in a minute. All right, we've done that bit. Okay, so here we're going to see a depiction of the protons going around the ring. So actually, they're not individual ones. They're all in a bunch. There's about a billion in each bunch. There's 2,000 uh, bunches, roughly, around the ring. They're, they're spread out. They're a few meters. Each bunch is a few meters long. And so... Um, yeah, you can see it. They're flying along uh, this in, inside of the, that tube um, in counter-rotating directions, and they um, most of the time when you cross the beams, they'll just go straight through each other. But but every time a bunch goes through another one, on average, there's a few that hit each other. Those are uh, those collisions we call events. Now, um, I, it, you don't, don't need to care about uh, jargon, but the reason I'm telling you is because I might accidentally start talking about events. So I just mean a collision instead of event, okay? Um, all right, and these uh, collisions, they're quantum processes. That means that um, they're dictated by the laws of quantum physics. So on any individual collision, you can't tell what's gonna happen. You um, can work, because the collisions are inherently random, they're stochastic processes. You can work out the different probabilities of different things happening. If you've got the theory correct, it'll match up to what actually happens. But, um, you know, often you're looking for very rare things. So, for example, you want to produce a Higgs boson. That only happens in one in uh, a billion collisions. So you have to do billions and billions of collisions to find these rare things. On average, one in a billion collisions. And you can't tell which one it's going to be. So what you have to do is do a lot of them, sieve out all the ones that are not so interesting, and look at the, look at the interesting ones. All right, so here we have two protons coming in to one of our experiments, hitting each other, and uh, go, leaving some tracks which are picked up by the electronics of the detector. I actually wanted to show you a detector, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, oh yeah, that's, that's it. So here is a, a picture of the Atlas detector. You can see the size of a human being there, okay, so it's big, it's about 40 meters high. Um, it doesn't look quite like that now, it's been closed up, so there's an end cap on, on the end, but this was a nice uh, view of it. Um, so these look like, you know, uh, Villains' lairs from James Bond movies. Um, what you can see here, that's the barrel toroid. That makes a big magnetic field that goes through this detector and makes the particles curve 
they'll curve uh, less if they've got more, more energy, because they, they, they zip through it. Um, and the direction of curve, whether they go left or right, depends on whether they're positively or negatively charged. So you can tell a lot about the particles you're producing in these collisions by um, the tracks that are left in the electronics of these detectors. And so the detector is acting essentially as a three-dimensional digital camera. It's recording what, after a collision, what comes out. So here we go. Um, you have the protons hitting each other. You have lots of tracks. The important thing are these, the big energy deposits were in these uh, yellow blobs here. They're in certain bits of the detector which only record photons, particles of light. Okay, and that's going to be important. This was an actual collision that happened um, six in the morning, five past six in the morning on the 23rd of April, Saturday 2011. Okay, um, so of course this is a computer representation, but it's um, the energy deposits and everything are correct. And the reason I've picked that one is because it's a candidate for having produced a Higgs boson, which then decayed into two particles of light and you pick up the two particles of light. Okay, so this is the way that you sieve um, the, the collisions. Lots of the other collisions will light up different bits of the detector and they're not uh, consistent with being Higgs bosons. Any more questions? Let's take a few more. Yeah. I was just wondering what, uh, how close to the limitations of the uh, the collider, the E needed for uh, Higgs boson is? Or yeah, that's a good question. The, um, the Higgs boson is uh, 125 times heavier than a proton. Okay, and the current beam energy in the Large Hadron Collider is uh, 13,600 times the mass of a proton equivalent. But when you collide protons, Actually, what isn't, what's happening is not the protons colliding. You, you collide the tiny particles at high energies. It's the tiny particles within. And you only get some fraction of the proton's uh, energy. So, uh, you know, there's some falling distribution, logarithmic distribution. Uh, but you get some collisions with, say, uh, like a few collisions with, say, 3,000 times the mass of the proton. And there's quite a lot now uh, with, with uh, you know, 125 times the mass of the proton. We'll see. I'll show you the data, actually. Yeah. How do you prove that the black hole will not happen? Is it just through equations? Or <laughs> no, that, that's a really good question. Do you know, CERN, the, the people that decided to do the safety review at CERN was the press department, because they realized there was this big story in the news, and they said, well, if we set up a safety committee to prove that it's uh, not possible, we can sell a lot of science to the press you know, which is their mission. They're publicly funded and they want to tell everyone about the science they're doing. So um, what they did was uh, they realized that actually these collisions between two protons at very high energies, they're happening on the moon all the time because you get very high energy cosmic rays coming in and, and impacting the moon. The moon's been around for um, five billion years. So that's enough. That tells you that it's, it's safe. Those collisions are safe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's one at the back. For, what's the first mentioned that the superconductors in the electromagnets were uh, cooled by liquid helium. Could you just use, say, a, a higher temperature superconductor that you could cool with liquid nitrogen and that'd be a lot too cool? Um, so, of course, CERN's looked very carefully uh, at the costs, and um, I think they, they couldn't get strong enough magnetic fields with the ones that are only cooled with high temperature superconductors. High temperature means 100 min minus 196 degree centigrade in this context. It's not exactly the Bahamas. <laughs> um, there was another question. I think it was yours, yeah. Um, so you mentioned the billions of collisions need to take place. How long does it take for billions of collisions? Oh, it's very quick. These beams uh, are going round the ring 20, 27,000 times a second. So they're going between uh, France and Swiss and Switzerland 27,000 times because it's right on the border of the ring. Um, there's no customs for them. <laughs> it would take a bit longer. So, um, so you feel, what happens is you, okay, uh, it took, in order to prove that the Higgs boson exists, 
You needed to produce quite a lot of them. We'll see why in a minute. Um, and it took uh, two years of running. And they run all night. So you, you switch it on, you fill up with protons, you get them all sped up to the right speeds. You run, you run uh, all night and all day. And then um, what happens is the amount of protons in the beam starts to go down. Not because of the collisions really, but because you know, a few of them occasionally hit the edges of the beam pipe and you, you lose them. And so um, they'll say, oh, okay, the beams are getting low quality now. Let's, let's dump it and uh, start again. So they, then they skim the beams off into a massive block of concrete underground. And you can hear uh, the beam hitting the concrete. It's got, the beam has a, the power of about um, a speeding train. So you can hear a beam, if you're near the concrete, you can hear a big bang. Um, and then you, you start again. And uh, yeah, so uh, they did a lot of collisions to prove that the Higgs boson exists. And you know, they're still going on, they're still looking for rare, rare events that could be surprises in the future. There's all sorts of measurements um, that we're looking to do and so on. I think possibly you were the next one. Uh, when you collide the two protons, obviously the sort of um, energy dis distribution after that is very, very unstable. So how quickly does it break down? Um, it's, it's essentially instantaneous. We can't measure the well, there are a few particles where there's a particle called the B meson, which is going to come up later in the talk, and you can produce them in these collisions. They're really interesting for my research, and they they uh, decay into other things, but they decay very slowly for particles. Okay, bear in mind they're travelling basically at the tr speed of light, and so they'll travel uh, about a millimeter before they decay. But you can actually detect that. You've got very accurate electronics, and you can extrapolate back and see that they didn't hit, you know, they don't, the tracks that come off this decay don't quite extrapolate back to the interaction point. Um, so, uh, you know, that's one case where you can measure that, uh, you know, some, something that's the energy developing over time. But everything else essentially happens, as far as we're concerned, instantaneously. And, and that, um, to get that millimeter, that's a, a billionth of a second. Ten, a tenth of a billionth. Yeah. I'm just asking about the size of the detectors. Is it because there's so much energy in the beam, but also the products of the collisions are such high energy that they have to, that they can only be stopped within a, a longer distance? Or is it because of the setup of the detectors that some particles get through the first layer? undetected and then are detected by a different type of detector in, a, in another layer, let's say? It's a mixture of the two things. Uh, in previous accelerators uh, last century, um, the detectors were kind of this tool, you know, so, so big enough, and that's because you need different systems to, to measure them. Um, but because the Large Hadron Collider is so high energy, it will punt, a lot of the particles will punch through, you know, you put, you put, in fact, lead and iron are put, put there to slow some of them down because you want to you get them stopped, basically, because you measure the energy by seeing what happens to them as they go through lead. And then once they've stopped and released all their energy, then you can measure it properly. So um, that's what you try and do. There are still some particles which get through the whole detector, and they're called muons. Uh, and you have these systems around the outside to uh, measure them. Um, and they're the only part... They're, they're, well, they're particles that get through and are measured, and there are other particles which you don't even measure. They're called neutrinos, and they, um, they sneak, they, they're like thieves. They uh, steal your energy of the collisions and uh, take, it, take it out, but um, yeah. Can I take one more question? Yeah, I think you've been asking, waiting yeah. for a long um, time. The, the quartz within the proton, do you know what ones constitute the uh, particle, the... the, the um, The uh, Higgs boson. Um, so the yes. Uh, so well. So the question was: the proton is made of uh, quarks. This is true. It's made of smaller particles. Okay, let me draw a proton. So of course the proton is a quantum object. So what I'm going to tell you is an approximation to the truth. There's three point-like particles within it. They're the quarks. Okay. Um, if you probe it 
deeply, you can produce other quarks and things, but dominantly, this is what's going on. Uh, but they're held together with some other kind of force field, uh, and that which has a particle associated with them. It's got a glue on, which kind of sticks the quarks together. Okay. Now, the Higgs boson, as far as we know, it's a fundamental particle, fundamental field. Uh, what that means is it hasn't, as far as we know, it hasn't got any substructure. So we are looking, I mean, that's a, an active uh, area of research and you try and probe it more deeply uh, to see, you know, smaller and smaller distance scales. Basically, if you increase the energy, you can see smaller substructure. So it might just be that we haven't probed them at high enough energies, the Higgs bosons yet, uh, and we need more energy to, in order, or, or more, more collisions to, to really tell. But as, as far as we know, it's got none. And as far as we know, these quarks and the, uh, nor the gluons have any substructure as well. We haven't seen it. So these, are, uh, yeah, I should have said. Okay, so there's two different types of quarks here, and in a proton, there's two up quarks and a down quark. And so, um, actually, dominantly, okay, I'm going to draw you a Feynman diagram now. <laughs> That's a good pedagogical tool. Um, what happens is, so we've got two protons coming in, right? There's a proton, there's a proton. Um, sometimes, once in a blue moon, they'll split off a gluon. These, this wiggly line means a gluon. They'll hit each other. You get some other products you're not interested in here. They'll hit each other, and they'll produce a Higgs boson drawn with a dashed line, and then the Higgs boson, um, one in 500 times, will decay into these two particles of light, that's called a photon, and that's drawn with that kind of wiggly line. Now, this just looks like some random picture, but it actually mean, mathematically means something very specific, and if I was going to work out the chance of producing a Higgs boson and of that decaying into two particles of light. This is the first step in the calculation. You draw this diagram, and then there are very precise rules which have been worked out with the quantum field theory in order to tell you how to calculate the probability of this thing happening and the probability distribution with the energy of the photons and everything you want to know about it. Um, so, so yeah, most of the Higgs bosons are produced from gluon-gluon uh, -gluon interactions from the proton. Um, yeah. Okay. That's good. You guys have got great questions. <laughs> I'm enjoying this. All right, so um, these are the particles we know about. These are the elementary or fundamental particles. So as far as we know, none of these have substructure. The up and the down you see in the top left-hand corner there, they've each got uh, three or two copies successively heavier. Um, we mentioned the electron before, that's got Two copies, there's the muon, and then that has a heavier copy, the tau. Um, these four particles in blue, they're force carriers. This G is the gluon, and the thing at the top is that's a, the Greek letter gamma. That's one of these photons, so it carries the electromagnetic force. W and Z are responsible for radioactive processes. Um, and when the LHC started, we were missing the Higgs boson. Okay, so what's the deal with the Higgs boson? There's Peter Higgs who um, helped invent it. You can see his theory on the blackboard behind him. You can see it's very simple. <laughs> Weirdly, I actually mean that. <laughs> um, but uh, the main interesting thing for us about uh, the Higgs boson, it was, that, it was that it was a signal that his theory was correct. And his theory told us how these particles get mass. Because before him, before 1960s, 67, when he came up with this idea, the standard model of particle physics, as it's called, was really successful, but it predicted that all the particles are massless. The mathematical structure of the theory was such that the particles had to have zero mass. And it, clearly, we measured them to have mass, right? So there's something fundamentally wrong about it. And um, Peter Higgs came along and, and worked out um, that there could be these additional fields throughout all of space called the Higgs field. Okay, it acts like a sort of jelly. You can think of it as some sort of weird jelly through space. In the early universe, when the universe is very hot and small, um, the jelly's runny. This is how you can think of it. 
and uh, of course it's an analogy. And then as the, as the universe, the Big Bang sort of uh, blows the universe out, space expands, space time expands actually, and uh, it cools down. And this Higgs jelly cools down and it kind of condenses in the vacuum. So you've got this weird quantum version of a jelly in the vacuum. And other particles um, zipping through it, they, in they interact with this jelly proportional to their mass. Okay? So the heavier particles, they get slowed up by the jelly more than the, more than the lighter particles. So that's in a very rough way of speaking. There's a precise mathematical theory. But in a very rough way of speaking, that's how it works. Um, and so he explained how the standard model of particles, um, you know, they, they have mass. And the signal that his theory was right was that it predicted a ripple on this jelly. That's the particle, the, the Higgs boson. And so you, the fact that, we, that it was produced 2012 and measured in CERN meant that his, it was a verification of his theory about mass generation. And of course, it resulted in a Nobel Prize for him and uh, a colleague in uh, Belgium, Francois Anglais, and you'll see that it's uh, the theoretical for the dis theoretical discovery of a mechanism that contributes to our understanding of the origin of mass, of subatomic <laughs> particles, etc. So this was a major uh, step forward. Now, uh, okay, so it's this this the Higgs boson was really the last uh, one of the last. Uh, pieces in a jigsaw puzzle of particle physics, um, but it wasn't the last piece because uh, we realized that this whole jigsaw is just one piece in a, bigger, um, in a bigger puzzle. And there are many unanswered questions, for example, what's dark matter and all sorts of things. Okay, so what we're going to see now is um, a depiction of the data, as it, and this is real data as it came in, so it's going to be a video. What we see here on the horizontal axis, you can think of as the energy of these two particles of light. So what you do is you do loads of collisions. You sieve out all the interesting ones, and you get the ones which only produce two particles of light. Okay? And if their energy comes in at 130 times the mass of a proton, that's this, then you add one onto the score here. Okay? And so what you're going to see is that we're going to start with zeros, and it'll all... Um, it'll all start adding up. All of these collisions come in with various energies along here. Um, and what you see on the top right-hand corner is uh, what the data looks like when you've added it all up, up to a certain date. Okay. So we start uh, in 2011, and what you see is this falling distribution. Okay, that's ordinary, there are ordinary collisions that produce two particles of light. You're not so interested in those. But the Higgs boson, they should produce energies of the two particles all centered around the mass of the Higgs boson. So what you're looking for is a bump on top of this falling distribution. And of course, there's, you know, this is a, um, a random process because there's a bit of statistical wiggle. So you've got to do some statistics to tell when there's a, a significant bump. Okay, so you get some wiggle around this falling distribution, but you see in the middle there is, uh, there is a, a bump here, and you say, well, is that, is that consistent with the wiggle? You do your mathematical statistics, we have this uh, five sigma uh, criterion. That means um, the chance of this being, being just a random fluctuation uh, is, one in, is less than one in a million. So that's the gold standard. So this was uh, seen as something being consistent with the production of a Higgs boson, which then decayed into two particles of light. It's been say, seen since in many different channels where it decays in different ways. And of course, you corroborate the different bits of, um, of evidence and see if it's behaving like it ought to behave. Any questions at this point? Yeah. Just so it behaves uh, decay in different ways, does that imply that it has a different masses, or is it always the same mass? Uh, the Higgs, so each particle species has one mass, um, but the Higgs boson couples to other particles proportional to their mass. So it will, that means that it decays more often into heavier particles, and the more heavy the particle is, the heavier, the more often it will decay into them. So um, it decays into, for example, um, 
bottom quarks, which form these bottom or B mesons, um, most often, and very often, it's, uh, if I remember correctly, it's about 20%, 20 of the time, fifth of the time, they'll go into two bottom mesons because they're heavy particles. Um, and then it, yeah, and so, you know, that's one example. So it's, it's uh, no, it's constant. So each particle species has a certain mass. So every electron has the same mass as all the other electrons. They can have different energies, but the mass is the same. That's the idea. Yeah. So why, why were they looking for specifically the two proton decay? The two, the two photons. photons? Yeah, photons. Yeah, um, it's, it's because uh, it's, yeah, because it's quite rare, right? Only one in 500 Higgs goes that way. And it's because it was easier to see it against the background of this falling thing. Um, because you can measure photons really precisely. With other things, you get much more, many more of them, yeah. but the backgrounds were just too high, and you the statistical wiggles would be too, would be greater, basically. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier that increasing energies allowed you to examine particles at a finer granularity. Yes. Am I right in thinking that that is limited to the Planck constant, you can't go beyond that, or Planck length? We don't know. The, the theory does, certainly does not go beyond the Planck length. So we don't know what happens there. You would expect quantum gravity to take over, but you don't know. I mean, we haven't got a theory of quantum gravity, so it's an unresolved question. I mean, I think potentially you can, you can go further, it's just we don't know how to describe it theoretically. But experimentally, presumably, you could. Uh, yeah, one more. So, um, I read in an article that there is this theory that particles pop into existence and then disappear in, in, in the vacuum of space. Well, it's, it's never a perfect vacuum, I guess, but it's very cold. So, are we saying that if two photons collide, they create mass and therefore they're, they're, there's the potential of creating particles and then they instantly degrade into two photons? And that's what mean. That's what physicists mean by particles popping into existence and then disappearing randomly. Yeah. Yes. And we, we see it in these collisions all the time. What you're talking about. So um, yes. Uh, I mean that. This is one example of, of what you're talking about. Uh, but also, what might happen is um, this photon, for example, which has got a lot of energy, that can randomly pop into um, an electron and an anti-electron, okay, We're, and they, you know, um, and they can reform and, you know, form back into a photon. Lots, there's many different things happening, and so it's actually observed. What you're talking about, it's not just a theory, it's observed in the experiments all the time, this kind of thing, and it's measured. Okay, I think uh, I'll carry on for a bit. We'll take more questions at the end, of course, because I want to get on to the research. And the research is about strange B activity. This is to do with the bottom mesons or B mesons. Um, and we've done that. <laughs> and we've done that. Ah, oh, that's because I'm going backwards. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So there's a specific uh, experiment uh, at uh, the Large Hadron Collider. Like I said, there's four. There's two general ones, Atlas and CMS. They're kind of looking for Higgs bosons and general new physics. This one, uh, it's called LHCb because it measures B mesons and B particles very well. Um, this is different. So the other experiments are like cylinders around the interaction point. This one is like a sort of cone around the interaction point. So you have the protons coming in. And this experiment, more or less, just looks like a cone very close to the beam pipe. And that's because close to the beam, you get a lot of these bottom mesons produced. And uh, if you measure uh, a thousand billion of them, you can look for very rare decays. You know, maybe one out of a thousand billion will decay in a particular way, and that's what they're looking for. And they're trying to measure, even if there are other decays which are less infrequent, but you want very precise measurement of uh, how, they, how these beam mesons behave, so you need to produce a lot of them. So this is a computerization of a collision uh, and produced a, a B meson on the left and it's de decayed into these three particles you can see here. 
Um, so the tracks that are reconstructed are shown in these colors. The, the, here, these kind of, um, the skylines are the energy deposits in the detector. And so this collision is consistent with producing uh, this K star. It's, a, it's another kind of particle. It's a composite particle, K star, and uh, to an electron and an empty electron. And uh, this kind of decay isn't behaving like the standard model predicts. So for a theorist like me, this is an opportunity because it might mean the theory's wrong and there's a chance for discovering you know, how to go beyond the standard model of particle physics. All right, let's get a bit technical now. <laughs> There's RK star on the right-hand side. This is the ratio of the frequency of decays. In, top one is in mu into dimuons, bottom with a K, a K star. Bottom one is dielectrons with a K star. The standard model predicts that ratio should be one. It's coming in at about three quarters um, until recently. Uh, if you look at these kind of decays and look at other things like angular distributions, they're way off as well. All the predictions are off. So um, this looks interesting from the point of view of new physics. Uh, and so, uh, you know, this is, we call graphs plots, okay? So the prediction is up here at 1. This is pre-December um, 22. And uh, these dots here, these show where the measurements are. So they're way, way off the prediction. They, they're kind of... Um, the sticks on the dots show you the size of the experimental uncertainties on them. It's different measurements and so on. Now, so uh, our idea as theorists is, well, maybe there's some other particles, some other fields throughout the universe. Fields and a particle are kind of dual aspects of the same thing. Particle is actually a quantum ripple in one of these fields, right? But uh, maybe there's some other species of particle which we don't know about, which are not in the standard model. Maybe they're too heavy to have been produced and, and identified at previous colliders or the Large Hadron Collider, but maybe um, they're interfering in this process in a quantum mechanical way. So um, here on the left-hand side, um, so uh, we have a B, if you, if you have these two quarks, that's a bottom meson and an anti-strange quark. If you form a meson with those, a, a, a combined object with, with gluons, that's a, a, a kind of B meson. Um, and it can interact via, if we have a new field, this lepta quark field, it can interact via it. Um, it will make it decay sometimes into these muons. Okay? It will change the probability of decay. It interferes with the standard model uh, calculation. And the thing I've been working on is a different, um, different version, and it's called Z prime. And it's a new version of a force, which does the same thing. I mean, it, uh, it breaks the B meson up in a different way. And, and so what we've been doing is proposing this new particle and force, seeing if it makes them decay in the right ways to explain the data. And then you have to check all the other data to see if it's been ruled out. Should it have been produced yet? You know. Should it um, have affected other measurements in different ways? You have to make sure that it passes all these tests. Uh, and then I want to say, well, um, to the experiments, well, this is how you can go off and produce it directly, like we did with the, the Higgs boson. And that's, so that's what we do. And they, indeed, they go and sieve their data. So far, they haven't find, found it, unfortunately. But, that, but um, that ha they haven't ruled it out yet. They're still looking. What does quark pie lighter? <laughs> Means, um, <laughs> Uh, okay, <laughs> loop level uh, means different diagrams with loops in. Four pi lighter means um, that you have to divide the mass of these. So to explain the data, it turns out um, the masses of these particles need to be a few, t a few thousand times the mass of a proton, okay? But if you've got a loop diagram, you can divide that by four pi, by about 12. Uh, it's, it's, um, this is from a research seminar. It's, uh, it just means that, yeah, with different kinds of diagrams, they have to be lighter than with the ones that I'm proposing. And it means that it's more difficult for them to pass the current experimental test. So what I'm, what I'm, that is a comment to say, you should believe this more than the other models. That's, <laughs> that's, that's what that's there for. <laughs> okay, so we've been, I've invented this new force, me and my collaborators. It's based on a mathematical symmetry. 
But the nice thing that this explains, like um, Higgs theories, theory did with the mass, with the overall how, why particles can get mass, this can help explain some of the details of the values of the mass that the particles have. On the, on the top right, you can see um, I've plotted on a logarithmic scale the, the, the masses of the different matter particles. So what you can see here is this, this T, that's the top quark, that's a million times heavier than the electron. Okay, so that's a, that's a big factor. And so each of these uh, here is a thousand times different. So you've got mega electron volts, that's a thousand of them, and that's a million of them, okay? And so there's a weird pattern in these masses that we'd like to understand as theorists. And um, it doesn't explain everything, but it explains why uh, these three on the right are much heavier than the rest, for, for, for instance, if you, if you start looking into the mathematics uh, of the theories I've been working on. Okay, I'm not going to go into too much detail on that because I think it's... Um, okay, so this new force, just to summarise, um, it breaks these B mesons apart, explains why some of the particles are heavy, explains other things, there's something called quark mixing, explains something about that. And the, the interesting thing is you can look for these new particles in the colliders and see if I'm right or probably if I'm wrong, right? So that's what you do. This, is the, this looks like the Higgs data that I showed you, but this is now sieving the data for, uh, and you don't look for photons now, you look for two muons coming off with very high energies. This is 3,000 times the mass of a proton. Um, the ordinary distributions are these, is this, um, the, this red curve. And what you can see is that data more or less follows it. So that means they haven't found any bumps on top. They haven't found any evidence yet for my uh, Z prime. All right, so I just want to finish before the quest final questions um, with a song. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> well done for coming out. I will answer questions now. More questions, yes. Uh, 
with this uh, an illustration of string theory. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> I've actually given I've given talks on particle physics in uh, in music festivals, and I took a guitar in order to demonstrate some uh, harmonics on strings and talk about string theory. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've seen the motors for a much larger collider. Yes. What is it that that will allow you to do, and why can't you do that in existing? Yeah, the, the trouble is, um, when you bend beams, you lose a lot of power in radiation. Through So the, the more tightly you bend them, the more power you uh, lose. So it limits the amount of energy that you can get up to. So the proposal, instead of uh, 27 kilometers along, is to have a 100 kilometers um, tunnel, which is going to go under the lake, under that lake I showed you, uh, and round the back of a mountain, back of the Celeb Mountain. It's going to be called, the, it's, at the moment, it's called the Future Circular Collider. Um, they haven't got funding for it, so it's not clear that it will be built. But they're trying to, they're lobbying governments, and I'm helping them, <laughs> to get the money um, to build it. And so it's the energy. They'll be able to increase the energy by seven times with such a big collider. So there are two stages. The first stage um, will be colliding electrons and anti-electrons. And there, it's not the energy, it's, uh, it allows you to do very precise measurements. Electrons are easy beasts to um, control, much easier than protons. And so the environment of the collisions is very clean and you can, uh, you can measure things very precisely. And so we'll be able to tell from very precise measurements, some of these, um, you can measure these uh, popping in and out of existence of these uh, particles that you were talking about very precisely. And so even particles you haven't seen directly might leave their imprint on the, on the measurements at these very small levels. So that's the idea. Yeah. Good question. Uh, I think you might have been, I saw you first anyway. You said that when you want to dump the bunch of particles, you put it into a concrete block. Yeah. How big is it and mm -hmm. how, often you how often do you have to replace it? Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know if it's been replaced. It's, uh, I, I don't know exactly, uh, but it, I think it's like tens of meters long. I've never seen it, and uh, yeah. Um, but it's, I mean, it will be degraded in the middle for sure. I mean, you're, you're uh, putting a lot of energy into there. Um, yeah, it's a good question, but yeah. It's, uh, it's crazy that you can, if you're near it, you can hear it. <laughs> you can hear the beams going into it. Um, there was some more, I'll get to you in a sec. Uh, Okay, let's go to you now. I, I, I'm just wondering how the, the mass or the energy of the, your new possible Z particle might right. compare to the Higgs boson. Um, the Higgs boson is a, uh, 125 times the mass of a proton. We know from the, the fact that we haven't seen it yet that the mass of the new Z prime has to be more than about 1,000 times the mass of a proton. Otherwise, you would have seen it. Um, yeah. But uh, it could be, it could still explain the B, B meson decays, these funny decays, um, if it were up to about 6,000 times. So there's, there's a big window for it to still be there and does not have, have seen it yet. And it's certainly worth sieving the data to try and see if that or some of the other explanations um, you know, are correct. Um, yes. Uh, you mentioned that the, uh, the, the the ring was underground to shield it from unwanted particles. Does that apply more at the detectors, or is the whole beam? No, it's the, detec it's the detectors. Because when you, when you get these detector re readouts, it would they, the whole detector would be lit up from cosmic radiation. But could you not tilt the? <laughs> I was thinking about could construction costs not be lower than if it was tilted or something? Or would what that the, the whole the whole ring? Yeah. Um, or are there environmental and other considerations? Yeah, there are. Um, there, I mean, make no mistake, with with a proton-proton beam, when it's on, it's radioactive, and you don't want it. You actually wouldn't want it near the surface. If you, with electrons and anti-electrons, there's no problem. But with protons, uh, at these, the amount of protons you've got in the beam, when you switch it off, uh, no one's allowed down for ten days. And then the radioactivity, uh, you know, cools down, and then you can let some graduate students down. <laughs> Would the uh, Z prime represent the six fundamental forces? Uh, yeah, it would, I mean, it would be a fundamental. It would be a fundamental force. Yeah, in the same sense as the other ones. Yeah. 
It'd be a big change to the standard model. It'd be, yeah, it'd be a big deal. Yeah. Well, what, I mean, any, any, yeah, any of these explanations that turn out, if they turn out to be true, will be a big deal, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. If the proof of the Higgs boson is statistical, wouldn't you want an independent calculation? Could it be just a loop of experimental setup, no? You, uh, yes, absolutely. And that's why there's two general purpose experiments doing the same thing at CERN. There's a CMS experiment and ATLAS, and they're not allowed to talk to each other. So you do have some man and wife teams now, because there's 3,000 people on each, and, but they're told not to tell each other anything. Um, but, but they both independently saw the same thing and it was consistent. But absolutely, this is always the case in particle physics, because you look at literally tens of thousands of different things, and so, you know, rat, small, things which have small chance fluctuations sometimes do happen, you know, you one in 10,000 chance. Especially if you've mis underestimated the background a little bit, or you know, you've got something slightly out, um, you can get these things which, uh, yeah, which sort of chance fluctuations. So you, you want an independent confirmation, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So I heard of this new type of particle accelerators which are much shorter, they are straight line, and they allow um, particles, like protons, to surf on the front wave of a plasma wave. Mm -hmm. And apparently they can come up to much closer to the speed of light in a much shorter amount of time. Um, what these articles don't talk about is how focusable these particles are. And I just wondered if you have an opinion. Is this the future of particle acceleration or it would, technical problems? It would re be re really great. but. I mean, every now and again, there's a story about these, but they've been around for decades and decades, and they 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 do very well over short distances, but but it, but they become unstable. So far, they become unstable after a few meters. So you can't get the energy up. It gets up to like um, you know the energy is equivalent to point one, a tenth of the mass of the proton in a few meters, which is very good. But then you can't get it above that yet. So, uh, and that's been, it's been like that for 40 years. So, um, unfortunately, it looks difficult. Uh, the, the plasma's difficult uh, beast to control. Yeah. Yes? Um, what's the mass of the particle involved in, in the decay, and that involves coupling between the bottom of strange quark and the new one or anti new one? What's the mass of it? And what's that particle called? Well, um, you mean in the standard model or in my theory? In my theory, it's called the Z prime, and I sang about it just now. <laughs> um, but some people have uh, a competing uh, theory, which is that it's called this lepta quark. Um, and yeah, I mean it's a, a similar thing. I'll show you. So um, this is the lepta quark on the left. So you can see it. It kind of it still interacts between the bottom meson on the left and the muons on the right-hand side, um, but um, in a, in a, just in a different way. So it's a, it's a competing theory. Um, it doesn't usually explain the masses of the particles, this le these lepta quark theories, but they're interesting for other reasons. Um, they, they have, they have colour. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a property associated with, uh, bottom, with quarks, which is this thing, they come in three copies. We don't know what to call the three copies, so we call them different colours. So lepta quarks have colour. That means you should be able to produce, pair produce them quite well with decent probabilities at the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, and they decay in very particular ways. They would decay into a quark and a lepton each. So, you know, that's being looked for actively, but we haven't, they haven't seen any of those either. Isn't there something about the lepta quark theory that it involves the regions between quarks and leptons. Yeah, it's, 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 the only part, it's the only proposed particle which couples directly to a quark and a lepton. So that, that is in, that's a different feature of it, and it's interesting, yeah. I have worked on those theories as well, but um, I prefer the Z-prime theory. <laughs> <laughs> it's just personal taste. <laughs> well, um, I think we're probably at the end of the time we've got for questions now. Um, I'll finish it off and say how many other professors of theoretical physics play in a cover band and finish with a song. <laughs> <laughs> Not aware of any yet, but uh, there might be some. Um, Richard, Richard Feynman. 
Uh, that's right, he bongos. played the bongos. He played the bongos. <laughs> yeah, that's right. um, well, I thought that was an absolutely brilliant talk. Thank you so much, Ben. Thanks, um, I think it was the absolute essence of the Cambridge Festival because you took theoretical research and explained it in a way that made it so accessible. Uh, so congratulations and thank you so much for that. Thank you.